Good afternoon. Welcome to our program, Treating Addiction During Pregnancy. I'm Julie Miller, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction Professional. Today's program is a Foundations Recovery Network webinar sponsored by Vallejo Resources Behavioral Health Recruiting. Thank you to our sponsor and to everyone in our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, there's a few details that we'd like to review with you. You'll notice that each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging or enlarged and minimized by clicking on the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. You don't have to wait until the end. But if you can't see this area, just click on that red Q&A button. To download a copy of the presentation, please click on the link in the resources area in the lower left of your screen. And if you have any technical issues during the program, please click on the yellow help button and we'll definitely help you troubleshoot the issue. A special note about CE credit. To receive credit for this program, you must click on the green CE certificate widget at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. You must watch the webinar for at least 50 minutes in order to obtain a certificate. If you're watching the program in a group, please download the group submission form located in the resources list and follow the instructions. If you have any issues with this process, we ask that you don't reach out to the sponsor as they will not be able to assist you in receiving your certificate. Please note that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event. Finally, you can also tweet during the live webinar by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing automatically at the event hashtag APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Christy Dively. Christy is a physician at Retreat of Lancaster County and completed her undergraduate work at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. She also attended medical school at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Memorial Hospital in York, Pennsylvania, and worked in private practice in Phoenix and Lancaster, Pennsylvania for five years. Christy, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. And with that, I will turn the audience over to you. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I am practicing addiction medicine now, and it's not a field I ever thought I would fall into. But once I started, I realized what a need there was for OB and uh, care of pregnant women. So I am happy to be here and happy to help. Uh, so here are the object objectives for the lecture today. And we'll start by talking a little bit about trends in substance abuse. So in 2013, 5.4% of pregnant women were illicit drug users, and this is not including nicotine. If you add in the nicotine, 15.9% of pregnant women are smokers. 8.5% of pregnant women report current alcohol use, and 0.3% report heavy use. Um, the prevalence in the public clinic is equal to the prevalence in a private clinic, and we see substance abuse in Caucasians, more than African Americans, more than Hispanics. Substance abuse disorder is the number one preventable public health problem for pregnant women. So why should we screen? Um, obviously, determining the patients that have a substance use disorder is the first step. So the reasons for screening are varied. Uh, they include the maternal complications of drug use, which are bacteremia and endocarditis for IV drug abusers, sexually transmitted infections from like HIV and hepatitis. This is not because of the drugs themselves, but because of the behaviors that go along with the drugs. There is an increase in spontaneous abortion, an uh, increase in placental insufficiency and abruption, postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, eclampsia, preterm labor, and premature rupture of membranes. There are also multiple fetal complications, including intrauterine growth restriction, 
Some of the drugs have actual teratogenic effects and can cause congenital defects, uh, intellectual disability, low birth weight, and neonatal abstinence syndrome. So why should we screen? Because as we all know, substance use disorders are treatable. We do also have an ethical duty to screen for substance use. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Committee Opinion 422 addresses the ethical rationale for universal screening for at-risk drinking and illicit drug use. Uh, the American Medical Association also endorses universal screening. So we all know treatment works, uh, especially in pregnant women. 70 to 80 percent of pregnant women can have a favorable UDS at delivery. Early intervention can reduce many of the adverse effects of tobacco and cocaine. Treatment while in pregnancy also enhances long-term recovery. Up to 65% of these patients are abstinent at one year. And brief physician advice has been shown to be as effective as conventional treatment for substance abuse. So the method of screening is every pregnant patient should be asked about substance use at their first visit and then at least once per trimester. The easiest thing to do is start with the two-item screen by asking the patient, in the last year, have you ever smoked cigarettes, drank alcohol, or used any drugs more than you meant to? Have you felt you wanted or needed to cut down on your smoking or drinking or drug use in the last year? In two random samples of primary care patients, if you had a no to each question, the patient had a 7.3% chance of a current substance use disorder. One yes answer gave a 36.5% chance of a current substance use disorder, and two yes answers gave you a 72.4% chance that the patient had a current substance use disorder. So once you've completed the two-step screen, if you have two no answers, um, stating that she does not use alcohol, tobacco, or drugs, she is at low risk for substance abuse, and you proceed to the four Ps plus screening. 4Ps plus is five simple questions. Did any of your parents have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Did any of your peers have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Does your partner have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Have you had a problem with alcohol or drugs in the past? And the plus is have you smoked any cigarettes, used any alcohol or any drug during this pregnancy? So if you had no answers to all of the above, this is going to be typical about, of about 85% of patients, and you've accomplished universal screening in about 90 seconds. These women are at low risk for addiction and should receive routine prenatal care for the remainder of their pregnancy, but you need to ask about alcohol, tobacco, and drug use in each trimester. If you get any positive answer at all, either on the two-item screen or the 4Ps plus screen, then your patient is at risk for substance use. A urine drug test is indicated. A brief intervention is indicated. You want to assess for psychiatric comorbidity and reevaluate the patient in two weeks. If there's no change in behavior, you want to consider referring them for treatment. So pregnant women tend to have even more treatment barriers than the general population um, for many reasons. This includes fear, shame, and guilt about their use, concern that she'll lose her other children if she enters treatment. Um, does she have any family support? Is there anyone there to step up and help with the other children? And also attitudes of medical providers. As we all know, people not in the addiction medicine world can frequently uh, have not so pleasant attitudes about people that have addiction problems. Uh, there's also a lack of comprehensive clinical care services that would accomplish all the problems associated with pregnancy and addiction. Um, these include simple problems such as can she even get to treatment? Does she have transportation? Does she have child care while she's in treatment? Basic needs need to be met in order for her to be able to fully engage in treatment. Comorbid diagnoses will also impact her ability to access the services. Um, it's difficult to address many issues at once, 
Depression, anxiety, and personality disorders are frequently complicating these cases, and patients also frequently have immaturity and lack of coping skills. Pregnant women may actually avoid prenatal care due to their drug use because of the shame, the guilt, fear of involvement of child protective services. Um, lack of prenatal care then leads to a myriad of other complications, and also the lifestyle associated with addiction can impact the pregnancy with problems such as poor nutrition, intimate partner violence, prostitution, and theft and criminal activities. So we're going to move into talking about specific issues at this point, starting with opiate substance use disorder. Um, the risks to the mother with opiate abuse is postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia and eclampsia, and septic thrombophlebitis. Risks to the fetus include spontaneous abortion, which is miscarriage, amnionitis, intrauterine growth restriction, placental insufficiency, preterm labor and delivery, and premature rupture of membranes. Now we've all been taught, you know, use Narcan when needed. Narcan can be a lifesaver in an overdose. Well, in pregnant women, that's the exception to the rule. Narcan should only be used as an absolute last resort in a pregnant patient. Giving a pregnant woman Narcan will instantly put the baby into withdrawal and could lead to fetal death. Um, could lead to spontaneous abortion, could lead to preterm labor. So how do we treat these patients? Well, medication-assisted treatment is the recommendation. ACOG Committee Opinion 524 states that the standard of care is methadone maintenance. Buprenorphine is an effective option. Um, withdrawal from opiates while pregnant is not recommended. There's a risk of preterm labor, fetal distress, intrauterine fetal demise, all just associated with the removal, uh, with the withdrawal symptoms. And these patients are also at significant risk for relapse, 41% to 96% of them. Medication alone is not enough. They also need therapy and psychiatric care. Um, buprenorphine is an effective option for patients who are new to treatment or maintained on buprenorphine prior to pregnancy. However, if they are already on one modality and they get pregnant, they should not be switched. So what do the outcomes look like for people who are uh, pregnant and treated? Methadone maintenance therapy is regarded as an established treatment with birth outcomes comparable to those in the general obstetric population. There are fewer preterm births, less intrauterine growth restriction, fewer low birth weight babies. We also see less maternal drug use. Uh, the higher the dose of methadone, the more maternal drug use reduction that we see. There's also improved prenatal care compliance, but there appears to be no differential effect of either treatment, methadone or buprenorphine. It is the exposure to the stable treatment that's what's important. Um, methadone maintenance therapy in pregnancy is supported by over 50 years' worth of research. As with any treatment or treatment of any patient with a substance use disorder, interdisciplinary care is crucial. Um, comprehensive methadone maintenance therapy associated with adequate prenatal care can reduce the incidence of obstetrical and fetal complications intrauterine growth restriction, and neonatal morbidity and mortality. Obviously, these patients also need to be in therapy. They need psychiatric care as well if uh, they have a comorbid diagnosis. So what are the two options for medication? Well, obviously, methadone is the gold standard, but buprenorphine can also be used. Methadone is an agonist, which suppresses their cravings and the withdrawal symptoms. It blocks the effect of other opioids and decreases cravings for opioids. Uh, comes as a liquid, a tablet, a powder. Can only be given in an opioid treatment program, and it is either given daily at the program, and some individuals may qualify for take-home prescriptions lasting up to 30 days. Uh, buprenorphine, or Subutex specifically is what we're discussing, buprenorphine only, 
is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. It'll displace morphine, methadone, and other full opioid agonists. It's also a full agonist at the kappa opioid receptor. Due to the partial agonist status, it does have lower abuse potential, lower level of physical dependence, and less withdrawal discomfort. You also see a ceiling effect at higher doses where increasing the, the effects of the medication um, re increase to a specific level, and then even if you increase the dose further, you don't see any other uh, resolution, any further improvement in symptoms. Um, there is gr also greater safety if a patient overdoses on buprenorphine compared to an opioid full agonist. So, which do you use, methadone or buprenorphine? Anybody who gets pregnant on a substance or on maintenance should stay on that maintenance. So if they're already on methadone, keep them on methadone. If they're already on suboxone, keep them on buprenorphine with the modification that they should be switched from suboxone to subutex. Um, buprenorphine should only be initiated if the patient can't tolerate methadone, if the methadone program is not accessible in the area, if the patient is absolutely adamant about avoiding methadone, and the patient is capable of informed consent. So how do you dose them in pregnancy? There's several different ways that you can do it, but it's important to be aware that the patients may require changes to their dosing as they progress through pregnancy. Um, metabolic changes, increased fluid volume, the weight changes associated with pregnancy, all of those could lead to the need for increased dosing. So how do you determine the right dose in pregnancy? Well, the right dose is the dose that stops their withdrawal symptoms. Um, they have an increased blood volume as a result of the pregnancy. There's a larger tissue reservoir. Methadone can be lost to amniotic fluid. Maternal, meta maternal metabolism is also altered. There is metabolic activity of both the placenta and the fetus. Um, the patient may continue to require progressive increases throughout pregnancy. Keep in mind that split dosing is always an option to maintain adequate blood levels with fewer increases, and counseling is essential to address the cravings, the stress, the anxiety. So if you're going to induce somebody on methadone and they're opioid intolerant, on day one, your maximum dose should be 10 to 15 milligrams. If their tolerance is unknown, on day one, they should have a 15 milligram maximum. And if they are opioid tolerant, day one dosing should be 25 to 40 milligrams maximum. The caveat for both methadone and buprenorphine is to start low and go slow. With methadone, it does take five days until the uh, until steady state is obtained. The peak is two to three hours after dosing. You want to make sure you see the patients frequently to monitor for over-sedation, and you may even want to consider giving that first dose in the office and observing the patient for three hours to ensure there's no over-sedation or respiratory depression. Some patients coming into the office might over-report their opioid use because they're afraid they're not going to get enough medication to prevent the withdrawal. Um, pregnant women also will often have a decreased tolerance because they've been trying to stop using on their own. So even though they may report a certain use, it may actually be less than that. Keep both of those in mind when inducing them and starting them on the medication. Um, start low and go slow. If a patient is admitted to the hospital and need to be either maintained on methadone or uh, started on methadone, the best thing to do is just to continue whatever their dose was. So if they were daily dosing, if they were split dosing, just keep it the same way. If you do need to divide the dose for whatever reason, because they're in the hospital, because they are getting withdrawal symptoms eight to ten hours after their dosing, um, it's they might have mild withdrawal symptoms for a few days until they reach that steady state. And when you transition from daily dosing to split dosing, you'll need to give 25 to 50% more medication than usual on the first day of split dosing. 
Um, you want to consider a split dose, as I said, in patients who feel okay throughout the day, but they start having withdrawal symptoms by bedtime and feel even worse in the morning when they wake up. On day one of the split dose regimen, you give 100% of their current dose and you do it under direct visualization. And then you send them home with 50% of the dose to take in 12 hours. Then starting day two and beyond, you can just give 50% of the dose every 12 hours. Um, if you try to just give them their start with half the usual dose on day one and split the dose right away, they're going to have poor results and they're going to see a lot of withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so we'll talk about buprenorphine a little bit now. Now, buprenorphine is not FDA approved for use in pregnancy in the United States. So it's just about everything else. Um, but it is widely used in Europe, so we do have a decent amount of data to support it. It is recommended that they be on buprenorphine monotherapy only, so Subutex only. They should not be on, nalo on naloxone because there's concern it could precipitate some withdrawal symptoms in both the mother and the fetus. Um, Without the naloxone, there is an increased risk for abuse, so more frequent monitoring of patients and their supplies may be required. Uh, improved pregnancy outcomes that we see with methadone, they also appear to be duplicated with buprenorphine. And the mother study by the NIH actually showed that newborns of mothers who were maintained on buprenorphine had less severe neonatal abstinence syndrome. They had shorter hospital stays. Uh, and had better outcomes initially. So as just with, as with methadone, the goal with buprenorphine is to find the lowest dose at which the patient is not using other opiates, not experiencing any withdrawal symptoms, there are minimal or no side effects, and there's no uncontrollable cravings for, drugs, for the drugs of abuse. Um, patients must have discontinued the use of opiates and be in the early stages of withdrawal before initiating the buprenorphine. You can start with four milligrams of buprenorphine and repeat the dose in two to four hours if indicated. You can then continue to repeat the dose as needed until the patient is comfortable and not exhibiting symptoms of withdrawal, but the maximum dose in one day should be 32 milligrams. Um, the dosing can be split twice daily or even three times daily as needed to minimize their withdrawal symptoms. And don't worry about them being, when you're starting them on Subutex, don't worry about them having some withdrawal symptoms. The mild withdrawal symptoms that you're associating with the Subutex, even if you need to give them another dose a little bit later because they start to have symptoms, are still way less severe than the withdrawal symptoms they would be experiencing if they were out on the street. So don't hesitate to get them induced. It's gonna be better off overall. So can these patients breastfeed? Absolutely, positively, 100%, yes. Breastfeeding may reduce neonatal abstinence syndrome symptoms. It is a uh, ACOG committee opinion 524 and 658 both support breastfeeding in patients uh, on methadone and on buprenorphine. Breastfeeding may reduce uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome symptoms. Breastfeeding also produce, promotes mother-child bonding. There are minimal levels of methadone and buprenorphine that are passed into the breast milk. And the only people who it will truly be contraindicated in are women with HIV and current users of other illicit substances. So what do we do with the patients that have acute pain? I mean, when you have a pregnant patient, at some point she's going to have acute pain. She's either going to have a labor and delivery and a vaginal delivery, or she'll require surgery for a cesarean section. Um, sometimes they even have to have emergent surgery for appendicitis and things like that. So it needs to be, the pain needs of these patients needs to be addressed. Okay, if a patient is already on methadone and they have acute pain management needs, Ensure their maintenance therapy is continued. Maintenance will not treat their acute pain, however, so you do need to give some additional medications. Um, Stadol, which is a frequently used narcotic in 
uh, labor and delivery will actually cause acute and severe immediate withdrawal of the methadone maintained mother and fetus and could result in needing a stat cesarean section due to the decompensation of the fetus. So avoid state all on labor and delivery. Um, Post-operative pain in methadone patients, you want to give them their confirmed maintenance dose of methadone and then give the appropriate analgesic for the surgery, whatever analgesic is appropriate based on the procedure performed. You may need to increase that dose 15% or more than you would typically give due to these patients' high tolerance levels. the patients on buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a highly avid um, binding to the receptors, or it has highly avid binding to the receptors, and it may block or reverse mu or opioid analgesia. Um, the best practices for treatment of these patients are continuing to involve, evolve, but there are several options. Um, obviously, non-opioid therapy is always an option, but Tylenol is just not going to cut it after a C-section most of the time. Um, you can continue their maintenance dose of buprenorphine and then avidly add an avidly binding opioid such as hydromorphone or fentanyl, which can displace the buprenorphine. Um, you, can, you can also continue their buprenorphine in divided six to eight hour doses or doses every six to eight hours, and titrate as needed. Um, another option, but not an option in a pregnant patient, is that you could discontinue buprenorphine two to three days before a planned event and um, increase their recovery supports as indicated. You may add methadone if needed. Um, stopping the buprenorphine a few days ahead of time will assure efficacy of the full agonist opioids that you could use for pain control, but they will require reinduction post-acute event. Obviously, this is not an option for a pregnant patient because a pregnant patient should not go through withdrawal symptoms. So what happens in emergency surgery? If a patient is on buprenorphine, there may be some opiate receptor blockade due to the high affinity for the mu receptor. Um, if at all possible, regional anesthesia should be used. So if these patients can have a spinal or have an epidural for their surgery, that will greatly diminish the need for opioid pain medication. Um, fentanyl and hydromorphone can override buprenorphine if needed, but you will need a higher dose than you're typically used to giving. It's also important to consider how you're going to preventing the, prevent this patient from relapsing. The fact of the matter is sometimes patients have to need, need an opioid, and there's no other way around it. Nothing else is going to control their pain in an acute situation. So if you consider a plan and have that in place, you can limit the chance of the patients relapsing. relapsing. Um, so some of those prevention, preventive methods include the patient never touches the paper prescription. A patient caregiver handles the prescription, fills the prescription, and administers the medication to the patient as ordered. The patient never touches the pills. The patient never touches the bottle. The patient does not count the pills. As soon as the patient has needed no narcotic pain medicine for 24 hours, the caregiver then disposes of the leftover medication. And it's essential that the OB physician and the addiction physician work together to solidify this plan. So now your patient has delivered and no longer um, needs the prepartum or the pregnancy doses of buprenorphine or methadone. So what do you do now? You may need to decrease the dose postpartum due to fluid shifts in the postpartum period. Um, you want to make sure as the addiction professional that you're seeing the patient as soon as they're discharged from the hospital before you give them a take-home dose of the medication or prescription. Um, buprenorphine dose may have needed to be increased in the third trimester, so then you'll need to consider getting that back down after they've delivered. Okay, so that's about everything there is about opioids. Of course, there is the most information on opiates and the most studies done on opiates, so we're able to cover that 
uh, in greater, much greater detail. Talking about the rest of the substances, uh, there is not as much information or as much studies out there, so some of these will actually be quite brief in, in deep, but I can share what we do here at Retreat for our pregnant patients. Um, so talking about sedative or hypnotic substance use disorder. The risks to the mother include obviously a seizure from abrupt withdrawal or respiratory depression if there is an overdose. Risks to the fetus, several of the benzodiazepines and phenobarbital can cause congenital defects, so there can actually be physical birth defects. Um, patients who are using sedatives and hypnotics throughout the pregnancy, the fetus is at, or the newborn, is at risk for neonatal abstinence syndrome and fetal death or spontaneous abortion can occur if the benzos are abruptly withdrawn. So ideally, you're going to want to taper a patient in the second trimester and do a very slow taper. Um, this is what you're going to want to do if you have a patient who is taking you know, 0.5 milligrams of Xanax three times a day and would just like to get off of it while she's pregnant. The patients that are actively abusing should not wait until second trimester. You shouldn't encourage a patient to continue abusing a medication just to get them to the third trimester. Um, but there is a risk of miscarriage, which is why you want to try to avoid first trimester, and there's also a risk of preterm labor, which is why you try to avoid third trimester. Um, you want to taper them at 5 to 10% of the dose per day. If possible, you want to use the same benzodiazepine that they have been abusing, if that's at all uh, a possibility. Um, you want to avoid using barbiturates to detox them due to the risk of congenital defects. And you always want to do this in conjunction with interdisciplinary care. Um, it is okay. Opioids are the only substance which a patient needs to be maintained on for pregnancy. Uh, any of the other ones, it is okay to detox them and safer for the baby if they are detoxed. We don't see the same risks of detox and, um, with the other substances and continuing Ativan or continuing Xanax during a pregnancy actually adds more risk. Right. Moving on to alcohol, uh, there's always a risk to the mother that she could have an injury while intoxicated, which could be life-threatening. They can go through delirium tremens while they're in withdrawal. Uh, there's nutritional deficiencies from the poor eating habits associated with alcohol abuse. Um, continue, moms who continue drinking can have problems with their milk production and their milk ejection. Uh, alcohol can also lead to precipitous labor, which is onset of labor to delivery in less than two hours, ataxia, difficulty walking, and respiratory depression from the intoxication. The biggest risk to the fetus, which is by no mean a minimal risk, is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is a whole other issue to discuss. During pregnancy, there is a direct effect of alcohol on the developing fetus. Alcohol affects the fetal brain throughout the entire pregnancy. So at any point in the pregnancy, drinking can have an effect on the brain and be detrimental to the fetal brain. Binge drinking, five or more drinks on one occasion, is especially detrimental to the fetus. And fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is the leading known cause of preventable intellectual disability. It's actually two times more common than Down syndrome. Alcohol-related birth defects and is one possibility associated with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and there's also alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, or the other side of the effect. It is possible to have both effects in one baby. So alcohol can have many, many, many effects on the developing fetus. It can lead to spontaneous abortion. There can be an intellectual disability, low birth weight, cardiac abnormalities, skeletal abnormalities, ocular problems, and can also be associated with hemangiomas. So here's a picture of a 
typical baby with fetal alcohol syndrome, they have some very characteristic facial features. Um, they're also associated with pre and postnatal natal, sorry, pre and postnatal growth restriction. They can have defects of the uh, central nervous system. Facial feature anomalies include a low nasal bridge, minor ear changes, an indistinct philtrum, micronathia, epicanthal folds, short palpebral fissures. They can have a flat midface and a shortened nose, and you can also see an elongated midface in these patients. Uh, they have a very thin upper lip, and they can have a flattened maxilla. Children that uh, are affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are frequently misdiagnosed as having a psychiatric disorder if a careful history is not taken or if the maternal history is not known. Um, children who are affected with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, they may not be able to complete tasks because they cannot recall the information. They may not be able to take in the information. They may hit others because they misinterpret the intentions of others. Um, they may take unnecessary risks because they're unable to perceive danger. There is a lot of psychiatric disorders that can be mistaken. Um, these include ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, psychotic disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, autism, antisocial personality disorders, and borderline personality disorders. So if you have a mother presenting to you who has an alcohol use disorder, how do you treat them? You want to taper them using short-acting benzodiazepines, so Ativan or Xanax or Clonopin, whatever you desire. Um, you want to avoid the long-acting ones. Here at Retreat, we use Ativan. We typically do the first four days um, on an as-needed basis based on their CEWA and their vital signs. And then after about three days, I look at their usage and write a taper based on how much they're using, how much they've actually needed. Um, you always want to avoid barbiturates due to the risk of congenital defects. And always, again, always, always, always in conjunction with interdisciplinary care and therapy. Nicotine use disorder. Um, is obviously a major, major problem with how many people smoke in this country. Um, the risks to the mother include lung disease, multiple different types of cancer, coronary artery disease, and stroke. Um, the risks of nicotine are not as immediate as the risks of some of the other drugs of abuse, uh, you know, such as the risk of overdose and death, so sometimes it's more difficult to convince these mothers to quit. Um, the risks to the fetus, however, are numerous and immediate. Spontaneous abortion, placental abruption, which can lead to placental death, placenta previa, which can also lead to fetal death if the mother goes into labor, uh, low birth weight. There are some congenital defects associated with nicotine, increased risk of preterm delivery, risk of uterine bleeding, and a risk of SIDS. There is actually a 4.4 times increase in the risk of SIDS if a mom smokes during pregnancy. And the babies of moms that smoke during pregnancy, these effects are actually lifelong. It's not just a disease or disorders that you see for a few months after delivery. We see these effects into adulthood. Um, kids of moms who smoke, and this is smoking while in utero. This is not even counting the secondhand smoke in the home after the baby is born. Um, ADHD, frequently see asthma and respiratory disorders. You can see an increase in middle ear infections, and they're also finding that as adults, these babies have trouble with increased risk for diabetes and an increased risk for obesity. So how do we treat these patients? Well, obviously, you counsel them to quit. Um, it is actually better, though, to counsel them to to quit gradually rather than just abrupt cessation. Uh, abrupt cessation can lead to some withdrawal symptoms in the fetus. Um, so you want to counsel them to cut down, you know, a cigarette every few days. 
Um, if they're unable to stop with a behavioral interventions alone, nicotine replacement products can be used, but it is recommended to use intermittent formulas like lozenges or gum rather than the continuous formula of the patch. There are very limited studies on the use of bupropion, and there is some evidence that it is associated with birth defects, so uh, it's not something that we use in pregnancy. All right, moving on to stimulant use disorder, including but not limited to cocaine and methamphetamine. The effects on the mother with these can also be uh, significant and immediate. Uh, mother has a risk of seizure. There is a big risk, especially with cocaine, of hypertension or a hypertensive crisis leading to stroke. And there's also risk of cardiac events and maternal death. Um, in the fetus, especially with cocaine, there is a big risk of placental abruption, the placenta separating from the lining of the uterus, which uh, frequently leads to massive bleeding, could lead to maternal death, and also frequently leads to fetal death. There's also a risk of premature labor, spontaneous abortion, premature rupture of membranes. Uh, meth is associated with some birth defects. We do also see attention impairments in the child when a mom has abused these substances during pregnancy, uh, low birth weight, and cysts. There is no detoxification protocol for patients uh, uh, using stimulants. You can, if you need to, use short-term benzodiazepines or antidepressants for symptom treatment, but the rule of thumb in pregnancy is don't add anything unless you absolutely have to, and because we know some of the benzos can cause birth defects, I would try to avoid it if at all possible. Um, consider monitoring the fetus. If a mom is third trimester and you're going to take her off cocaine or she's going to get off of cocaine just because of the associated risk of abruption, um, if a mom is of a gestational age where the fetus is viable, you may want to consider doing it in an inpatient situation so the baby can be monitored. And as always, interdisciplinary care. Um, cannabinoid use disorder, there is very limited information about this, surprisingly. Um, risks to the mother include panic attacks, short-term memory impairment, amnesia. Risks to the fetus, intrauterine growth restriction. Newborns have an abnormal startle reflex, and we do see some reduced memory and verbal skills at age four, but it does not appear to have an effect on intelligence. Having said that, we do know that marijuana and other forms of THC can affect fetal brain development and the child behavior. Um, you would treat them the same as a non-pregnant patient, counsel them to quit, supportive care, and interdisciplinary care. So that covers all of the substances. I did want to just add a little bit of information about some of the other uh, issues that affect pregnant women. So neonatal abstinence syndrome. Babies are born and they are suffering withdrawal symptoms. It's primarily seen in moms that are abusing opioids and or on maintenance therapy for opioids, but you can also see it in benzos, in alcohol, in barbiturates, some of the SSRIs and antidepressants, and nicotine. Um, the onset of the symptoms of the baby depends on the substance, and there is a wide range of symptoms that you see. There is an effect on the central nervous system. There's GI effects. There's respiratory effects. There's autonomic effects. Um, the CNS effects that we see include irritability, hypertonia, hyperreflexia, and 1% to 3% of these babies can actually have seizures. GI effects include diarrhea, vomiting. They can have abnormal sucking reflexes, which leads to poor feeding, which leads to poor weight gain. Respiratory effects include tachypnea and respiratory alkalosis. Autonomic effects include sneezing, lacrimation, yawning, 
sweating, hyperpyrexia, and a high-pitched cry. Anybody who's ever been in a nursery or in a NICU with a baby that's coming off of opiates or is, it's a very um, characteristic cry and it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, babies who are suffering from neonatal abstinence syndrome, they can also, sorry, I forgot to move that slide. Um, they can also have delayed effects of symptoms. You can actually see symptoms for four to six months, and they also have an increased risk of sudden infant death syndrome. So how do you treat these babies? Well, it's primarily symptomatic. You're going to swaddle them. You're going to give them frequent feedings. You're going to use IV fluids. You want to decrease the environmental stimuli. Now, a typical NICU is full of alarms and bright lights and people and, and bustle, and that's the last thing that these babies need. Some NICUs have actually developed or set aside a specific area for babies going through withdrawal, so it can be kept dark, quiet, calm. Um, you also give soothing behaviors, whether it's a pacifier, or a massage, um, and when supportive measure fails, medications can be used. Um, the medications include tincture of opium, paragoric, methadone, and phenobarbital. And with all of those medications, they'll, you know, titrate them down. Um, I read a statistic that the average cost of treating a newborn with neonatal abstinence syndrome is $53,400. So the biggest concern that I hear from my moms who come in in treatment is, do you have to call children and youth? Do you have to call Child Protective Services? And are they going to take my baby away? Now, I'm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, so I can only speak for our local regulations. But the Lancaster County Children and Youth Services have said to me they cannot open a case on a child which has not yet been born. Therefore, again, in my county, mandatory reporting of drug use in a pregnant patient is not necessary. They get reported at delivery if there's a positive drug screen. However, if you fear another child in the home is at risk due to maternal drug use, then consideration should be given to reporting the drug use. Um, and the other thing that they have told me at our local children and youth is she couldn't tell me with 100% certainty that if a mom is in treatment, doing what they're supposed to be doing, going to therapy, taking their meds, that the baby wouldn't get taken away because there's a lot of other um, factors, but a mother in treatment is going to be looked upon much more favorably than a mother that's continuing to abuse and coming in with a positive opiate screen. There are 13 states which have legislation to terminate parental rights due to maternal drug use. These include Florida, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Maryland, Minnesota, Nevada, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Texas, Virginia, and Wisconsin, and there are eight states that require reporting of positive drug testing. Arizona, Illinois, Iowa, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Utah, and Virginia. And there are just a few of my references. Um, some of the other slides, I had the references in my speaker notes. So if there's something specific that you wanted the reference for, feel free to reach out to me, and I can get that there, get that to you. I thank you all for joining me today, and that's about all I have for you. Great. Christy, thank you so much. What an excellent presentation. Uh, before we get into the Q&A portion of the event... I would like to hand things over to Leah Boone from Foundations, who will give us a few words from our sponsor. Leah? Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help, to share stories of recovery for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration, and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people to get involved, give back, and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K race series at these locations across the country. And as a thank you for your, your attendance today, please enjoy the discount code WEBINAR2016 to register for any future 6K events. Back to you, Julie. 
Great. Thanks so much, Leah. We have had a number of questions that have come in from the audience, but we'd like to remind you that you can use that Q&A widget below the slides on your screen to submit a question. And we're just about coming up on the 50-minute mark right now, so now is a great time to consider filling out your CE certificate information by clicking on that green CE widget. Okay, Christy, someone in our audience is asking about clients who want to taper off all of their medication treatment, including buprenorphine. Is that something that's recommended, that a pregnant client tapers off of buprenorphine entirely? It is not recommended that they taper off. The standard of care is maintenance, preferably methadone, but, you know, we don't use methadone here. But it is not recommended. So if you did have a patient taper off and you did have a poor outcome, it would be difficult to back it up, you know, for a legal precedence without the backup of the standard of care. Um, having said that, I have had patients who have tapered off. Most of them have ended up back here within a few weeks with a relapse. So I really push them now to stay on the maintenance therapy. Okay, great. And a number of people in our audience uh, have been asking about Vivitrol. Is Vivitrol treatment during pregnancy recommended at all? Uh, what about patients that are already using it? Um, what are your thoughts on that for pregnant patients? It is not recommended for use in pregnancy, and I will make sure that I add slides about naltrexone for, for Vivitrol the next time I do this. Um, I did not specifically research that, but I do know it is not recommended for use in pregnancy. Um, if they are on it, um, obviously, you know, you would stop it at that point. I'm just looking up real quickly the safety information of it. Yeah, I mean, the risk of teratogenicity is not expected, um, but there's very limited human data, and because we don't really know whether it's safe or not, it's just recommended to avoid it. Okay, great. Good information. Uh, and a number of people are also asking about uh, what is the time frame for methadone treatment to continue after the pregnant mother has delivered the child? That is something that can be determined with the addiction professional. Once the baby has been born, there's no restrictions to how quickly you taper them off. Um, it can be done as if any other patient. Okay, and um, a few people in our audience are also asking about the use of antidepressants. Can they be used safely? Should they be used? What if someone is already taking an antidepressant? Uh, how do we treat a pregnant patient um, who's already using these um, drugs? been taught is you have to weigh the risks versus the benefits. If mom is on something, doing well, stable, and going off the medication is going to cause her to relapse or cause her to have a major depressive episode, then absolutely she needs to stay on the medication. The only medication that I am aware of that you really need to stop in pregnancy is Paxil. Um, there was some association of Paxil with some heart defects back when I was a resident. Um, now, I haven't been actively practicing OB for several years now, so I'm not quite as up-to-date on some of those types of medications. Um, yeah, but there, with Paxil, there is a risk of teratogenicity in the first trimester, neonatal withdrawal symptoms, or serotonin in the third trimester, and there's also risk of um, possible risk of neonatal persistent pulmonary hypertension. So Paxil is the one medication that I would say you need to taper them off of. Um, if you need to start somebody, again, risk versus benefit. If they absolutely need to be on something, then it is okay to start them. Um, with the understanding that the SSRIs can have some uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome as a result, and that Wellbutrin is not generally used. Um, Okay, and uh, can you also Sorry, talk a little bit? The, I was looking up for some of the other drugs, what the uh, what the pregnancy category is. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we didn't lose you there. Yeah, no, no, sorry, I'm still here. 
Um, like Effexor, um, the risk of fetal harm is thought to be low. Um, there is some risk of neonatal withdrawal or serotonin syndrome based on limited human data. So actually, it looks like the SNRIs could also be an issue, but if the patient needs to be on the medication, they need to be on the medication. Okay, great. And can you talk a little bit about levels of care? Um, what can be the uh, the continuum of care for pregnant patients, uh, particularly as they're transitioning from inpatient to outpatient settings? Um, I'm not sure what exactly you're asking about level of care. You, talk, you mean with therapy or with OB care? Um, however you wanted to interpret the question on that. Okay. Um, well, I guess if, if you're, you know, you have a pregnant patient who's in an inpatient rehab setting, um, then absolutely once they leave here, they should step down to something else, whether that be partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient program, but they absolutely need to continue with the therapy and continue working on their addiction. Um, OB visits typically are going to be pretty much the normal pattern, so they would be seen every four weeks up until 32 weeks. Um, the OB physician may want to see them more frequently or they may get sent to the high-risk OB doctor for a little bit more intensive monitoring and ultrasounds, but I've left that up to the local OB provider that we work with to take care of our pregnant patients. Okay, great. And you had mentioned um, a number of substances, including alcohol. Someone in our audience is asking about crystal meth. Um, do you have a best practice for what to do in that situation? Uh, meth would go along with the same treatment as cocaine, as a stimulant. So it would be there's no specific detox for it. Um, there is some association of congenital defects with meth. Um, and you may, as with cocaine, you may want to consider detoxing them in an inpatient setting if they're third trimester just to ensure safety of the fetus. Okay. And uh, someone in our audience is asking for some more detail on SIDS. Can you um, talk a little bit more about then the infant and some of the risks, including SIDS? Um, I can't necessarily speak on SIDS. I'm not a pediatrician, so uh, all I really know is that the association we see with it, but there is definitely an increased association versus the population that is not abusing drugs. Um, for nicotine users, um, I believe it's also alcohol users. Sorry, I'm flipping through my notes here. Uh, the... Um, Cocaine, yes, the stimulants, so cocaine and meth can also increase the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and I think, no, I guess that's it. I thought maybe marijuana as well. Um, sudden infant death syndrome is one of those things that we still don't really know what causes it. You know, there was a, for a while, was it babies that were sleeping on their belly or was it babies that were getting suffocated by their blankets in their crib? And it's just one of those things they're still studying and still haven't necessarily come up with an answer to. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions today. But we do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. And again, should you have any issues with this process, we ask that you do not reach out to our sponsor. They will not be able to assist you with your certificate. To receive your certificate for this program, you must click on the green Program Evaluation widget, complete the evaluation form, and click Submit. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the Group Submission Guide and Program Evaluation located in the Resources area and follow the instructions provided. For those watching from a mobile device or a tablet, you will need to email the Help Desk to receive a program evaluation and certificate. Please note that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event. If you have any questions, please click on the purple Contact Webinar Help Desk widget at the bottom of the screen. 
Also, if you enjoyed today's program, please join us again on Tuesday, July 26th for our upcoming Addiction Professional Webinar sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network along with Valeo Resources Behavioral Health Recruiting. The program is Trauma Triage and Addiction Counseling, and it will be presented by Randall Leah. A link to register for this program is located in the resources box on the lower left of your screen. And finally, I would like to thank Christy Dively once again for an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank Valeo Resources for making today's Foundation's Recovery Network program possible. Finally, thank you to everyone in our audience for participating today. We hope that you'll join us again in the future for another Addiction Professional Webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Good afternoon. Welcome to our program, Treating Addiction During Pregnancy. I'm Julie Miller, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction Professional. Today's program is a Foundations Recovery Network webinar sponsored by Valeo Resources Behavioral Health Recruiting. Thank you to our sponsor and to everyone in our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, there's a few details that we'd like to review with you. <clears throat> 